In the case of nuclear or radiological fallout, people living around potential targets such as military bases and chemical plants may be advised to evacuate. Well, hello, Sublation Media viewers and readers and listeners and creators and content producers and <laughs> consumers. And uh, what else? What else are you, you people out there? Socialists? Um, it's the Sublation Magazine show again. I'm Douglas Lane, author of the novel Bash Bash Revolution, uh, evil CEO and boss of Sublation Media. Um, and of course, podcaster extraordinaire. And, and I'm Ashley, Ashley Frawley. I'm Ashley Frawley. I'm currently a visiting researcher at the University of Kent. I'm a sociologist. I'm the author of two books and many, many articles and studies. And I'm a frequent uh, media commentator. And in the UK, we say broadcaster when you're on TV sometimes. So that's that's me and what I do. And my new book is coming out apparently in a couple of weeks. So look out for that. What's the title of that book? What is it? Significant emotions, rhetoric, and social problems in a vulnerable age. I'm very good at titling books. No, I'm not. Uh, it's terrible. Yeah. Uh, but it is about it is critiquing therapeutic fads and questioning: Is there really a mental health crisis in universities? There isn't. Okay, so um, I am thinking about changing uh, the the name of this show from Sublation, the Sublation Magazine show, to the Israel Palestine show and just cuz it's all we talk about now but um this week we are uh we're covering the conflict in Israel and uh, between Israel and Palestine or Israel and Gaza and Hamas and um we've got Ralph Leonard waiting in the wings in the, the green room or the blue room or one of the rooms his room um <laughs> to come on the stream <laughs> in just a moment uh uh, I'm not actually going to change the name of the show, by the way. Uh, but um, and he has written for Unheard uh, about uh, Franz Fanon and uh, how people are interpreting Fanon today in the context of the attack by Hamas and the struggle for Palestinian uh, liberation and a Palestinian state. And we're going to be glad to talk to him about that in just a moment. Uh, but I have like some things I. So much that you want to you know. get off your chest. So I wanted yeah. to know, Doug, mm -hmm. what would be, what's your, what are you thinking in terms of the conflict at the moment? Because we have been kind of noncommittal, um, horrified, uh, and trying, we, we tried to make a space to think a little bit more deeply rather than calling for more blood. As I said, I went on Times Radio and I begged for a ceasefire. That seems to be the uh, a, a rising kind of perspective or a rising demand at the moment. I was at a debate festival over the weekend and I heard all kinds of different views and I feel like uh, I am more hopeless than ever. But what do you think? What's well, a, I think that's a realistic portrayal that, of the situation. Thank you for that. Yes. Well, I can give you a realistic portrayal because I've been uh, consuming the media content of John Joseph Mearsheimer, the political realist. Um, and I, and I don't have a, a hot take. I just have what I, I, I have basically cribbed from Mearsheimer as, a, as to a realistic view of what's happening. So um, to start with, I just have like nine points from him. The Palestinians will soon outnumber the Jews in Israel. This means that integrating and assimilating the Palestinians into Israel and granting full citizenship rights and voting rights uh, making Israel into a democracy would lead to the elimination of Israel as a Jewish state, which makes that option unacceptable to the current Zionist um, government. The second point, the two-state solution has been off the table since Oslo. Israel is not interested in a two-state solution. Hamas, likewise, is not interested in a two-state solution. Uh, so there's no real process towards negoti negotiating a two-state solution right now um three the current quote compromise which is an apartheid state is unstable nearly everyone but the most committed supporter of israel has noted that the apartments uh, apartheid state creates the conditions that make terrorist attacks on israel very likely uh for israel would like to ethnically cleanse gaza 
That is, they seek to push the sur those who survived the attacks in Gaza into Egypt or other nations, Jordan maybe. However, their effort to do so creates a risk of a multi-front war uh, breaking out, and that would severely threaten Israel both militarily and politically, and they would lose standing in the world community. Egypt and Jordan will not allow the uh, ethnic cleansing of Gaza. They do not want to take in a the huge amounts of refugees that would, would be the consequence of that. Um, Israel's other option is to defeat and remove Hamas and install a governing body in Gaza that would be friendly to Israel. But this is not really possible because defeating Hamas would require actions that would open them up to a possible multiple multiple front war and further even if they could defeat hamas replacing hamas with a friendly government is impossible under these apartheid conditions no palestinian government that is seen to be friendly to israel could gain the support from the palestinians they would need in order to govern uh number six the survival of hamas is likely a peace process and end of the occupation of palestine most likely cannot proceed through negotiating with hamas Seven, given Israel's need for international support and U.S. support, Israel will most likely eventually scale back the violence and not ethnically cleanse Gaza. They will not be able to defeat Hamas. Israel's dependence on the U.S. is constraining Israel. And they won't be able to defeat Hamas uh, partly because of pressure from the United States and the, the threats from uh, uh, Hezbollah and Iran. Eight, this is why hardline supporters of Israel are calling for breaking ties with the United States. And you can read about that in publications such as Tablet. Um, the, the, the thought is that uh, the United States' relationship with Israel is constraining Israel, stopping Israel from adequately defending itself by ethnically cleansing Gaza. Nine, unless the United States can alter its relationship with Israel and bring real pressure to bear, and push it to become a liberal bourgeois democracy rather than an ethno state, or alternatively, push it to negotiate with Palestinians to create a two state solution, the apartheid state will continue. This means that something like the status quo, a status quo that now includes the risk of a mass of massively brutal terrorist attacks on Israel, will continue. So that's my, those are my nine points from the conservative political realist John Mearsheimer. Um, I added, one of the comments says, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. What does the comment say? Oh, uh, us as a moderating factor. That's a good joke. Ha ha ha. Well, you know, it's worth noting that, um, both the United States left and the Israeli Israeli right are ultimately seeking the same thing right now. Both want Israel and the United States to be less intertwined. Um, so, if we put uh, aside fantasies of a regional war breaking out, a regional war that defeats both Israel and the United States, which some on the left might fantasize about, you know, a, a, a big old war to bring down the U.S. and Israeli empire, um, then, you know, and maybe opening up an opportunity for our communist comrades in China to invade Taiwan and check U.S. power. If we put that aside, that fantasy aside, um, most of the U.S. left simply wants to pressure the United States government into breaking its uh, current policy of unconditional or seemingly unconditional support for Israel with the hope that this will create conditions necessary for the end of the apartheid state. Likewise, though, um, the most hardline Israelis want to break from the United States because they see the United States as currently constraining is Israel's response due to the U.S geopolitical concerns about a regional war so uh and and it's need the united states's need to maintain good relations with saudi arabia and egypt um so israel the hardline israelis think of the united states currently as constraining the israeli response um so u.s leftists want uh the united states government to uh, break off its unconditional support from for Israel. The is, Israelis want the hardline Israelis want the, to break off U.S. relations because it, the 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 support is already too conditional. Um, but they both aim to 
change the relationship between the United States and Israel and uh, in the same direction, make the two nations less entwined. Um, so, well, look, the, I mean, let me ahead. tell you what I think is the a realist <laughs> uh, idea of what's happening here. Um, I don't think that there's any solution on the table that's sane. And I think that that has, I, I don't know. Uh, there's a very good article by um, Thomas Fadzi on Unheard, I think it was last week, um, talking about the the trajectory that relations have been through over the past, you know, 70 years. And um, you really get the idea that every time that there is some kind of sane solution on the table, which involves some kind of compromise, obviously, uh, the most extreme forces have conspired to destroy it every single time. Because the problem with a sane solution is that at the end of the day, no one gets what they really want. And uh, what the ultranationalists want, obviously, is the entirety of what is now uh, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. And they have an opportunity to do so at the moment because you know, there's horrific violence and so on. But that, but Hamas, now everyone is saying, oh, but Hamas has now become a lot more moderate. And they have argued that they're not really out to destroy all Jews, et cetera, et cetera. They only want to destroy the Zionist, they only want to destroy the Zionist state and the apartheid state, blah, blah, blah. But mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that's particularly true. I would be, <laughs> I would doubt that quite a lot. Don't worry, we're now bourgeois. We won't change our minds. Um, anyway, so it seemed to me that they, the ultranationalists and Hamas got what they wanted in the end, which was a fight to the death, or are getting what they want now, which is a fight to the death, uh, and a final solution, whatever that might be. And uh, there's just no sane way out of this, because that's what they want. They want to fight it out till the very, very end. Hamas just uh, isn't the, Hamas isn't the player right now. Like, Hamas had its move, made its move, and now it's all coming down to what Israel response is going to be and what the other players are are going to do it's not hamas's uh move so we can say oh hamas is, didn't do these things hamas did do these things or hamas this or hamas that um hamas is not going to determine the short-term outcome of this conflict they 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 will sur most likely survive it but but the reasons they will most likely survive it is not due to their military might, but due to the overall conditions. So, um, but, uh, you know, but like too much of an emphasis on Hamas right now uh, is, I think, a mistake. And if you just want to get a realist understanding of what's happening uh, in in the world. And so the I want to say that um, the U.S. far right position is probably more aligned with the center position that's that an israeli hardliner would think of as being constraining but the, the lindsey graham and hillary clinton and others in dc have made it clear that they will support israeli attempts to destroy hamas uh, and will back israel with the full force of the u.s military um both have a promise not only to allow for the obliteration of Gaza and um, ethnic cleansing there, but also to obliterate Iran if Iran attacks Israel. Now, maybe that's saber rattling. I don't know what would actually happen, but the idea here is to allow, I, I think the realistic idea here is going to be to allow Israel to cope with this situation as it sees fit within the constraints of world opinion meaning the other bourgeois governments and other nations opinion and then ultimately um you know get through this kick the can down the road um and maintain the apartheid state and that's i think i could return to what a, a new version a new normal where Israel has is far less secure, it's more paranoid, more likely to be attacked, or at least you know lives with constant fear for a while of being attacked. Um, and but with no negotiations for any kind of settlement, 
and both and everyone thinking everyone else rightly thinking everyone else is are just brutal murderers i think is is what the outcome is going to be so it's a weakening of of the apartheid state but not it's overcoming um that's what i that's that's what i think is happening well, I, I mean, I think when I said that, like, they wanted a fight to the death, I didn't mean that they could actually win. <laughs> and that was no. the issue. And, that, and that's that's kind of the the, the issue with um, cele people who were celebrating Hamas. And then, of course, famously now, Judith Butler's, oh, we have to open up a space on the left for Hamas and recognize them as, you know, a, a radical force. I mean, part of the reason why it was being celebrated in some quarters of the so-called left is because we are so used to seeing catharsis as revolution itself, as subversion, as our main form of protest, just endless subversion. And uh, what we used to call in the early 2000s culture jamming, we're still doing that, right? It's just mm -hmm. it's just disruption. Oh, just disrupting. Like, why do you do that? Oh, it's, it's to disrupt the comfortable order of the blah, blah, you know. And this is just the ultimate, most horrific fucking dis disruption. What happens tomorrow? We don't give a shit because the whole point was to disrupt. And now, of course, what happens tomorrow is horrific repression. Um, and that, no one's got anything to say about that except please stop. <laughs> right. I, I, I including don't me. Think, including me. Right, right. I know, I know, well. including me. I don't think there's a realistic uh strategy for fundamentally changing the conditions in the region, even to the level of creating like a bourgeois democracy in Israel or a two-state solution, where we have, I mean, let alone anything remotely connected to you know emancipation of the working class and of humanity is so the the creation of socialism um where what we got instead is the management of barbarism and that's what we live with all the time um so so ralph ralph leonard looks like he's ready to jump out yeah i want him i, I want him to come in yeah like... <laughs> so what, ralph leonard to... recently wrote about uh fanon for unheard ralph welcome uh -huh to the chat to the conversation um do you want to say anything about what we were discussing already or, or correct all of our horrible topic? horrible mistakes yeah um I, well just a more first of all a more general statement about the sort of general crisis um i i think it's kind of clear that all of this is we've okay so since 2008 which is when um we've had this first cycle of you know hamas launches like futile rockets the Qassam rockets at israel and then israel retaliates and bombs gaza to you know uh, a lot well what you know and there's this sort of very fiendish phrase that's been used called mowing the grass as it's been called and we've had this for five times since 2008, uh, uh, 2008, nine, 2012, 2014, 2021, and now 2023. And we've seen like the same kind of pattern. A lot of Palestinians have been killed, especially disproportionately children. Um, Israel has had to endure a lot of uh, uh, public relations debacle. Um, you know, we've seen like anti-Semitism and, and Islamophobia rise in other parts of the world at the same time, because other parts of the world view the Israel-Palestine conflict through a different lens, like either through a kind of the indigenous rising against the settler colonists or Islam versus Western civilization, where Israel is part of the West, you know, Team West. That's they're on <laughs> yeah, our right. team. Yeah, they're on yeah. our team, <laughs> and the Palestinians are part of the Muslim hordes. Even though, mm -hmm. you know, there's a substantial minority of Palestinians that are Christians. So just so that often mm -hmm. gets forgotten, and that's how this is always kind of interpreted. And we've seen we've had this same kind of pattern it's just that now it's more intense and it doesn't seem like this one's just going to resolve it you know resolve this cycle 
you know, because mm. and it's also and this cycles an outcome of when Israel in two thousand five did its so called disengagement from Gaza, which is Ariel Sharon's when they unilaterally withdrew from Gaza and took out all the eight thousand settlers because well for various reasons like one like ideologically within the revisionist zionist movement gaza isn't as important as say the west bank which they call judea and samaria so there was like let's focus more on that which is more crucial and also that it, and also it serves as a way to splinter the palestinian movement because you know hamas because they, you know, it was kind of obvious that Hamas and Fatah were going to have this power struggle in the Gaza Strip, and then Hamas won in the 2006 elections, and then they beat off a coup, which the US actually supported, you know, attempted coup uh, against the PA, and they established their own sort of dictator, you know, this kind of pathetic dictatorship in Gaza, and mm -hmm. that's. The effect of that has splintered the Palestinian movement, which means that a two-state solution basically becomes unviable. And the effect of that is that it benefits Israel, especially the Netanyahu government and the Israeli right, because they like, you know, for them it's great that Hamas is in Gaza, you know, because mm -hmm. their policy or their kind of strategy for years has been like. We can contain Hamas, like make sure they don't like threaten us too much, but keep them there because, you know, that means the Palestinians are further divided and, uh, and any kind of unitary, contiguous, viable state becomes virtually impossible. Add that to the fact that more there's more settlers in the West Bank and they've you know taken more land and dispossessed more Palestinians and more evictions and now because of all since october 7 there's more like lynchings or killings going on so that basically has um you know uh you know it works in to their advantage even if they don't necessarily intend it even with all the rhetoric about we're gonna eradicate hamas you know mm. that that's mm -hmm. that's just the you know the facts of the matter yeah, I mean, they don't have the capacity, really, to eradicate Hamas. They don't have, it just isn't, a, it's not really in the cards. It doesn't look like. I would be very surprised if if a full-scale invasion where they truly, you know, went into those tunnels and killed everybody they could and then pushed, uh, oh, mo you know, uh, so many more Palestinians into Egypt and and so. cleaned out Gaza of Palestinians and Hamas, I mean, if that happened, I would be, on the scale it would need to, I mean, the consequences for Israel would be pretty catastrophic, yeah. I would think. Yeah, and it, it would give a pretext for other actors to intervene, like Hezbollah right. yeah. in the Hezbollah, north of Iran. Yeah. Iran, yeah, exactly. So that's what they're trying to avoid. That's what the United States wants to avoid, which means the long-term strategy is to basically keep Hamas where it is, can try to con contain it again but they've been shown that the, the the israeli people have been shown that they're not safe under those conditions yeah. you know yeah because um, the the arrogance and hubris of the israeli leadership was to presume that this status quo was sustainable that you could maintain it indefinitely and say you know normalize relations with like the neighboring arab countries especially you know the gulf states saudi arabia because of you know, there's a convergence of interests, to be a realist about it, a convergence of interests between Israel, the United States, and the Gulf's Arab states over Iran. So, you know, there's a mutual sort of benefit to this. And they, and I, it presumes that the Israeli government thought that they could sort of relegate the Palestinian issue, like, really down the international agenda, like, on the same level as you know western sahara or occupied cyprus that you know maybe occasionally the un will have a summit over it but nobody really cares and on mm. october 7th that just blew up in their face like it reveals that mm. 
no, this this status quo was always unsustainable. Right. Yeah. And yet I think it's going to return. Just, you know, it won't be sustainable either, but I think it, it's going, going to return. That's my my thought. So let's talk about your your uh, essay in Unheard that's called Hamas Apologists Have Misunderstood Franz Fanon. How, how, who are these apologists for Hamas? Mm-hmm. Well, the, in the initial stages of uh, the so-called Al-Aqsa flood, as you know, Hamas and the PIJ called their offensives. Um, you had, you, you know, there were certain people. You know, I'll name them, like Navar, you know, Rivka Brown of Navarra Media, on the which has a which is a big voice on the British left. You know, she put out this tweet, you know, saying that uh, you know the struggle for freedom is rarely bloodless, but this is a great day for. Palestinian liberation as they broke out from their cages and, you know, emancipated themselves. And, you know, you could also find, you know, various voices like, you know, within university campuses and that kind of sphere kind of not merely kind of, you know, carrying water for it, but kind of actually celebrating it or like saying they're exhilarated by it to quote one, uh, professor in the United States and and part of this apologism if you will was invoking Franz Fanon the wretched of the earth in particular the chapter concerning violence and Mm -hmm. and he he often gets dredged up in this in Israel Palestine conversation because because obviously he is the symbol of the new left of a particular kind of understanding of revolutionary violence that the new left kind of you know believed in and but i think it's a lopsided caricature of fanon that's been been invoked not just by the presumed decolonizers but also by even his critics like because there was also a flurry of critics on the right who were saying that October 7th was the vindication of Franz Fanon. That's what it leads to, blah, blah, blah. And I just thought, no, 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 no. Like, because it's kind of obvious to me that they've not really read him in any kind of serious, like, methodical way, that that they just read the parts of On Violence, that chapter, and get mm-hmm. they get sort of fixated by, you know, the passages that talk about, you know, the cleansing or the proper translation would be disintoxicating effect of violence or the collective catharsis that, you know, violence against the colonizer can have on the colonized, but they miss out like the other part, which is like where he warned that just violence for the sake of it, for its own sake and disconnected from any kind of wider political or social vision is a trap door that it, it inevitably just starts to degenerate on itself. And if if you won't mind, that there's a passage from The Wretched of the Earth I want to read out mm-hmm. that a lot of people don't quote in this discussion whenever the, the question of Fanon and violence comes up. And he, where he says, racism, hatred, resentment, and the legitimate desire for revenge alone cannot not nurture a war of liberation. These flashes of consciousness, which fling the body into a zone of turbulence, which plunge it into a virtually pathological dream state, where the sight of the other induces vertigo, where my blood calls for the blood of the other, this passionate outburst in the opening phase disintegrates if it is left to feed on itself. Of course, the countless abuses by the colonialist forces reintroduce emotional factors into the struggle, give the militant further cause to hate and new reasons to set off in search of a colonist to kill. For day by day, leaders will come to realize that hatred is not an agenda. And I think that, to me, that just refutes that caricature, that that obviously he believed that when that colonialism as a system 
is inherently violent. That inherently is a total if, um, suppression of the other, of the colonized subject, which means that it will produce violence in return. That's true. And he also, yes, he believes that, you know, the native inflicting violence will, you know, restore his self-respect. But as I quoted, you have to be aware of the trap door, that simple kind of bloodlust against your enemy isn't enough, isn't, is not a political agenda. And I think that's mm -hmm. what people, a lot of people miss. So, um, Yep. So that was the, the oh sorry. So that was the point that I was trying to make before, where that that I saw the exact same thing, where it was like, because we're so used to this kind of endless subversion, there is that there was this tendency to kind of celebrate that because it was just subversion, and subversion becomes an end in itself. But also, there's no imposition of a will tomorrow, right? There's no responsibility for world building. Um, um, and that's kind of where we where we stop, you know, every time that there's this great, you know, in, in lots of different countries, you know, you had like violence on the streets in Greece, you know, in 2008. Well, there's always violence on the street in Greece, but like, <laughs> you know, enormous sort of riots and so on. But they, you know, they get to the steps of power and they're like, let's turn back. You know, um, mm -hmm. So there's it, this this is why it becomes a particularly scary and nihilistic kind of violence, because. There's no, for me at least, it seems to be that there's no possibility of, of taking it any further. It is just an end in itself, and that's why it's so horrifying. Mm -hmm. And it's it's even more horrifying that people would celebrate it because it seems to me I don't know I haven't worked this out completely yet, but there's this like overlap between our aimlessness and our desire to be truly radical, which just means like to make the aimlessness even more horrifying and more horrific, more more disrupting. And that would that's that's it. That's the extent of it. I don't know if I'm being clear there. Yeah, and I think there is a tendency on the left to have a bit of a nostalgia for the armed struggle, anti-colonial movements of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and we kind of sort of just mindlessly kind of glorify it in our mind, in our mind, and so like the you know some people sort of genuinely believe that the initial stages of October 7th where was basically the Battle of Algiers, you know, that film, <laughs> Ponte mm -hmm. Cobos. But as I, as I say in the article, it was less the Battle of Algiers and more Pasolini Salo. And if you've watched that film, you will know exactly what I mean by that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know. Wait, wait, for those of us who aren't, can you explain <laughs> who haven't? Like, Pasolini Salo, which and the full title is also 120 Days of Sodom, <laughs> which that's that's basically a clue, a reference to Marquis de Sade. It's yeah. basically like it's an art house snuff film, basically. <laughs> it's this unending um, sequences of like the most brutal forms of torture, rape, murder. Bias. It's, and he it, and what Pasolini was trying to do with that film was kind of undergird the kind of psychology of fascism. Like it's a you know it's looking at the you know the psychological dimensions of fascism and the violence that the nihilistic violence that undergirds it, if you will. So mm -hmm. it's so it's actually more poetic than I even presume. <laughs> I have not seen Salo, but I've heard of it. Um, you know, I, I've got a general gist of it. Um, do you recommend the film? Ralph? Yeah, so just for the novelty of it. <laughs> okay, all right. But I would, but not to live it out. Yeah. It's not, not like a revolutionary film. To, you yeah. know, it's not a manual. Um, yeah. uh, so, Ralph, in, in, oh, sorry, uh, did you want to ask a question based on that? No, last you go point? ahead. You, you go okay, ahead. Okay, so in... In the article, you you explained just as you did now that um, Palestine in 2023 is not Algeria in 1956, um, which was Fanon's main paint, uh, point of reference. And you also said that we can't put Israelis in the same category, um, that while the oppressors in that situation had a mother country to which they could return, you say Israelis do not. I think one of the things that disturbs me about this is that if you kind of think through potential pathways of the most extreme versions of 
of a solution here. Um, I was talking to somebody over the weekend and we just came to this like black filled moment, <laughs> which was probably completely wrong, but, and it was um, that if let's just say the most extreme versions of this fighting over this tiny plot of land, they get what they want, you know, and Israel manages it's, it's not what you guys said, which is just a continuation of this awful kind of threat forever. But let's say Israel gets the, the ultra nationalists get what they want and Israel takes all of, all of, what is now, you know, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And they, uh, you know, then it will, it won't end, you know, because people will keep fighting for that. They will continue to not want, there, there are enough forces in the Middle East that do not want a Jewish homeland, that it just won't end there. But if Israel got wiped off the map somehow, the most extreme people, anti-Zionists who want to wipe it off the map, and I don't know if people really knew what they meant when they were chanting from the river to the sea, but let's just say that they, that who the people who really believe in that, they get what they want. Um, then it, it might actually end because I'm not sure that people care enough about a Jewish diaspora. <laughs> um, mm. but, it, but, but it seemed like that the only, and that's unrealistic anyway, I think. Not that There's everybody plenty that of powerful people. There are plenty of powerful people who care deeply about a Jewish mm -hmm. diaspora, and and to think that there is not is crazy. I mean, the, 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 oh, yeah. the, the, the American, you know, in America, the, the 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 there are a lot of wealthy lobbyists who are making sure that the interest of Israel, which they claim is yeah, no, no, no. When I say I don't, diaspora. when I say that nobody cares, I mean like nobody cares in terms of like a a, a movement that is against like those in power I mean, pe plenty of people will care but uh, what my point is that it just will never fucking end <laughs> like i didn't i didn't see i don't see any kind of end to this and this was like my my kind of like black pilled moment it's not like you can like push people out and then they just go home because there's that's not how it works I mean, in this situation. Like, yeah. it's, it's, it's a it's a bad it's a bad analogy to make with algeria for for tons of reasons but also that there even if you were to beat whoever you think is the oppressor in this situation whoever is the, well even if you were to like beat the colonizer or whatever it does it will never end there it just uh, i i i please can, tell can, me why this is wrong and there's hope can, <laughs> can i throw in a comment before we move on because i want to the the comments are really interesting someone says okay keep making it all about the 7th of october decontextualize distort whatever you will ciao i think maybe they've left um then they, they think we don't didn't we don't notice a decontextualization and then someone says to my comment about how there are plenty of people who care about the fate of the Israeli people and that they, they not only are there plenty of people that they have some political power is I'm fetishizing American Jewry uh, when I say that. So, wow. Um, so, uh, Ralph, do you want to tackle the question of whether or not we've been discussing and decontextualizing the 7th of October? So, okay, so why did Hamas attack on 7th of October? Like, because there's, there's two parts to it. A, there was the offensive against the military targets, where they kind of managed to break, you know, cut off the surveillance cameras and bake through the fence and attack military outposts. Like, so on that sense, that's like classic guerrilla, you know, guerrilla warfare, you know. But then there's also the second stage, which is obviously the Tribe of Nova um, massacre, where, you know, the ravers. And then, you know, the, what happened in the kibbutz, where, you know, gangs literally basically hunted down like Israeli civilians in their homes and, you know, enacted like the most, you know, all any kind of brutality you can think of. So why did that happen in the way it did? Now, maybe the Hamas leadership didn't intend for the horror show in the kibbutzes, but, and you can sort of explain it in the way that, well, many of those commandos were young men. They probably grew up throughout the um, wars in Gaza from 2008 onwards. That that's what they knew. That's what they grew up into. That's their, how they came of age. And obviously, 
you know, because Gaza was occupied before, there was already bad blood then, and these wars just intensified it. And probably, probably, you know, they probably felt, you know, had this idea that, you know, I want my revenge. I want my vengeance against them, you know, the 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 Israelis, the Zionists, or whatever. And on October 7th, because partially aided by the IDF's dereliction of duty in the Southern Front, because uh, they, you know, uh, was it Netanyahu dispatched troops to the West Bank to protect some settler festival or whatever, then they, you know, they had their chance. They, they really got the chance to stick it to the enemy, you know, ressentiment, you know, Nietzsche's phrase, ressentiment, and to completely, you know, humiliate them. You know, it's this kind of eye for an eye morality, you know, because Israeli bombs destroyed my family or another Palestinian family, therefore I'm going to burn an Israeli family alive. Now, that's an explanation for it, but it's not, but you can't, like, uh, excuse it or kind of try to sort of dampen it down or minimize it. Because another thing that's happened, right, is this sort of effort to sort of tone down, like, the real horrors of what happened then. That because, like, say, like, this stuff over the 40 beheaded babies that was circling around that because that wasn't true in the way that it was reported even though we actually do know that kids were murdered that that is just un indisputable that because they weren't ritualistically beheaded isis style therefore hamas didn't commit any atrocities like you've seen non sequiturs of that kind or and you can see it on the other side in the Israeli war in Gaza that because like you know the hospital Al Halil hospital because we don't know that Israel may or may not have actually bombed it therefore Israel doesn't bomb hospitals or doesn't bomb civilian <laughs> areas like the, you know it's these is this little these little kind of like really nonsensical forensic the base that we, you know, so often the argument gets swerved into them, which kind of, and you kind of miss the sort of the bigger picture of it. And that's, you know, where everything hinges on this information, little piece of information being true or not true. And if it's true or not true, then that determines the entire picture, if you know what I mean. You know, like, right. No, I agree. Um, so when you, when, well, how did you interpret the charge overall? Like what was, what do you think was behind this allegation that we were decontextualizing, distorting? I, the, I, uh, I, uh, I think it's because of the fact that it's actually nearly a month since October 7th. Mm -hmm. And because like in the initial stages that Israel did have a bit of goodwill, in the international stage and mm -hmm. because like within a week of that like israel kind of got rid of that goodwill because of its bombing like, yeah because of its bombings in gaza <laughs> and because mm -hmm. what we've seen since then is dead palestinian kids instead of dead no Israeli food kids. no fuel yeah. Yeah. um you know get out get you have two days to get out of the north and go south mm -hmm. no because humanitarian yeah. Order, and then allegedly you know. allegedly bombing areas where they said they were safe, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, Leaked and, um, documents saying that this is an opportunity to finally ethnically yeah. cleanse Palestine, yeah. et, cetera, and, et cetera. As well as like deranged rhetoric from their leaders. So the president of Israel, Herzog, saying that, oh, there's really no distinction between Hamas and Palestinian civilians. Or Benjamin Netanyahu making a reference to a to a passage in the Bible that mandates genocide, you know, Amalek. Like mm -hmm. and, you know, personally, you know, I don't think that's wise to invoke that passage, especially if you want to refute charges that Israel is committing genocide against the Palestinians. 
Personally, I don't think that's a good idea, you know, to mm-hmm. invoke a genocidal passage in the Bible. But mm-hmm. it's it's stuff like that, like especially since you know the first week of Israel's bombing, it put more bombs on Gaza than the Americans did in Afghanistan for the whole than in the, the first year. So they so no, there was no kind of strategic or military kind of objective behind it or making distinctions between combatants and civilians it was simply just revenge bombing like just we're gonna just bomb all the whole place if hamas fighters die who yeah if civilians die who cares like it doesn't really matter in that sense so Mm -hmm. and because we've seen that that horror show it can lend itself to the charge that Oh, why are you just talking about October seventh now? Why are you mm-hmm. bringing that up again? You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, the, but the point is, you have to see it holistically. Well, I mean, what saddens me the most is that we don't have a socialist politics at the moment to uh, to stand. You know, that doesn't give us a standpoint for our own project. So what we're stuck doing is kind of objecting to the barbarism of the ca- of the capitalist world um, without any clear s- strategy for changing it. Uh, and we are so far away from having a socialist politics that the idea that we'd want to fundamentally change the conditions is almost an abstract. People, when we talk about the need for that, people get a loss. Like, what, what, are, what exactly are you talking about? Um, and it and it doesn't seem to be really practically feasible right now without a, any kind of socialist party or international socialist movement to talk about uh, about socialism and um, and having a position that wouldn't embrace either you know the U.S. and, and Israeli imperialist states or the Islamic nationalist movements and Hamas. You, you, you know, like you're you're whose side are you on is the is the phrase of the day rather than you know how do we uh break free from these conditions yeah and um you know i think also another thing is that we haven't learned the lessons of the original decolonizations of the 20th century Mm -hmm. like because when i mentioned you know you mentioned the pied noir in Algeria and you know they had they were forced out afterwards and I would say that the Algerian solution is bad for was is going to be bad for Israel Palestine but because it was bad for Algeria you know that's not <laughs> that's not what Franz Fanon wanted he didn't want the Pied Noir to be expelled he wanted to transform that relationship between colonized and colonizer to have, as he put it, an Algeria open for all, where citizenship and you know your place in the colony wasn't determined by your race or your ethnicity, but was determined in your as a civic term that it would that Algeria would embrace the Muslim Arab, the Pied Noir, the Berbers, and the Jew as equal citizens. That's what he wanted. So that's mm-hmm. why the Algerian solution isn't going to be good for Israel Palestine because it was bad for Algeria and what's what did happen to Algeria afterwards you know like many decolonized states it degenerated into you know ethnic and nationalist dictatorships and civil wars mm-hmm. you know is that what is that is that our vision for decolonized Palestine is that what we really want because that because under current conditions suppose like it's it's a fantasy scenario but suppose like Hamas or anybody else managed to do an Algeria on Israel, it would mm-hmm. obviously it would obviously be a tragedy for for um, the Israeli Jews, the Jews of Palestine. But it would also mm-hmm. be a tragedy for the Palestinians, because what will come afterwards isn't going to be some romantic uh, Elysium, you know, where you know they'll get back to their olive trees and all that. It would be it would be what would happen in Algeria, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. 
No, exactly. Which is why we have been saying the left ought not to romanticize and ignore and, and back Hamas. Not because we are choosing Israel over Hamas in a, in a us or them equation, but mm -hmm. because we want to develop a socialist politics that would yeah. perhaps be able to realize Fanon's vision, you know? Yeah. Which isn't and, actually that insane a vision, right? It's the fucking like basis of modernity, yeah, right? Liberal <laughs> democracy. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Um, so, anyway, I'm sorry, I'm swearing now. Obviously, not a professional uh, broadcaster here, like like Ashley is going on TV all the time. You can't do that. <laughs> but anyway, go ahead, Ashley. What do you want to jump in? Nope. Okay, you're not ready. Um, let's see. Uh, Let's see. Oh, she's talking, but we can't hear her. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, let's see. There's a couple more comments here while she tries to get her sound fixed. Um, uh, so there's no solution for the conflict within the context of capitalism. Israel is a neoliberal state with deep integration with the U.S. capital. Israel does not need the Palestinians. Um yeah. But, oh yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, thank God it worked. Oof, all right. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about no that. Trouble. Anyways, go, go on. Go ahead. Read the comments. No. Um. Do you want to re respond to that, Ralph? The comment. Yeah. yeah that comment reminded me because I I told you this earlier of the comment by Moish for Stone when he talked about the conflict that the way it's uh, it's kind of ironic how this when war happens within this conflict, it doesn't exacerbate social contradictions within each side. It kind of freezes them and cloaks them, you know, because, you know, because there's always a tendency to talk about this as the Israelis versus the Palestinians without understanding that both societies have their own internal class and social contradictions, like as would mm -hmm. be the case in any society, because with, they are they're not outside like capitalist you know the globalized capitalist world or anything mm -hmm. like that and he and he made the comment that you know we sometimes mistake the intensity of armed national militancy for social radicalism it doesn't indicate it you know because mm -hmm. and the point about hamas is not to moralize against it that's not the primary objection, nor is it to somehow sort of say that Palestinians have no right to resist occupation or anything like that, is that their politics is bad. Like people don't, that they're anti-socialists. They are an, you know, a nationalist group. They are uh, part, they are the part of the national bourgeoisie of the Palestinian nation. They are gangsters who just so happen to know how to recite a Quran, you know, um, you know. Mm. I, and I, re I saw this kind of interview on Al Arabiya TV, which is Saudi-run TV, where they interview was interviewing um, a Hamas official. His name is Khalid Michel, and she asked him about, you know, the fact that a lot of Israeli civilians were killed in this, and you know, we. We'll, did you think it was quite intelligent that it would invite that the fact that Palestinian civilians would would pay the price for this? And his response was actually a little bit shocking because he responded by invoking the 30 million Soviets that died in the Second World War or the 3 million Vietnamese that died in Vietnam. And he said that, well, we Palestinians will sacrifice as many people as we need to 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 liberate our country and I, and that just reveals it that literally just reveals it that like any kind of nationalist group they see the people that they want to rule over as cannon fodder because for them because mm -hmm. for them it doesn't matter how many palestinians die it could be eight thousand six thousand could be six million who you know it wouldn't matter to them and that's why we should that Hamas, you know, 
like socialism in Palestine is not going to come on the backs of Hamas. Like that's just not. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. It he isn't. was speaking of the Palestinian people the way Madeleine Albright spoke of the Iraqis. Remember when she yeah. she was asked, you know, it seems like there might be, I don't know, how many millions of dead Iraqi children yeah. due to the U.S. sanctions on Iraq alone? Do you think it was worth it? And she kind of paused and said, yeah, it was worth it. You know, <laughs> like, and what, why? In order to serve the U.S. national interests, it was worth it to let mm -hmm. all these people die. Um but at least in the United States, generally speaking, they don't say, oh, yeah, millions of dead Americans. It was worth it to, you know, it, it, our, our policy was worth worth it. Um, and I would hope that yeah. in, in Israel that Netanyahu is going to pay the price. for. Oh, he is. Uh, he is. He is going to pay the price. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and also just because we've heard a lot of analogies about October 7th, like it's like the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, or I saw Norman Finkelstein sort of compare it to sort of Nat Turner's Rebellion or John Brown's Raid on Harper's Ferry. Some people mm -hmm. compare it to, you know, the mass killings of French colonists by Dessaines during mm -hmm. the Haitian Revolution. I think those analogies are a little bit off. Like, if we want a direct analogy, it would be the Battle of Philippeville during the Algerian War where mm. the FLN, who wanted to take the initiative from more moderate Algerian nationalists, organized like, you know, mobs and their soldiers to attack the city of Philippeville, which was heavily European and Pied Noir. And what happened that day was they basically carried out, you know, mass killings, like brutal, really, really brutal mass killings. They, like, you can't dampen what happened like kids were killed people were disemboweled like to the mm -hmm. cheers of Allahu Akbar or sort of traditional ulitations like mm -hmm. uh, like a fiesta was made around it and you know because of the nature you know I think like 800 like people were killed mostly kind of Europeans and because of the nature of that attack it was so that obviously the French would condemn it as their savages um, as well. And, but then they would say, the FLM would say, this is revenge for the 10,000 Algerians that have been killed by the French since the independence riots of 1945, all of which is true. And what happened as a result of that? Well, what happened was the governor of Algeria, who was known as like a bit of a liberal and very accommodating to the Algerians, then had to, you know, put a massive reprisals, which then killed 10,000 Algerians. And the effect of that polarized Algerian society, and it actually worked in the FLN's fa favor because of the nature of the reprisals by the government and the Pied Noir militias who would just indiscriminately attack uh, any um, Algerian they saw on the street as well, brutally. And it, it that kind of it reminds me of like Albert Camus' comment on the whole thing, where he sort of said, "Look, I can defend freedom fighters, but I cannot defend murderers of women and children." And like that's mm -hmm. just simple. Like you just need to end it there. Like and mm -hmm. and the if we want to use that analogy even further, that it reveals. Also, that the Israeli um, retaliation is no more intelligent than the French retaliation in Algeria or the Americans after nine eleven. Right. It's no more. It's like it's no more intelligent. It's like it just compounds the problem. It makes it even worse than it already was before. So the, mm. and so there's I nothing. There's nothing uh, you can really take from it as celebratory, or this is the, that you can say that this in some way advanced the Cal Palestinian cause. In fact, it can regress it even further back than it already was before. Mm -hmm. Well, I just remember after 9 11, mm -hmm. uh, wanting, d d trying to organize in what, what there was of the peace 
movement in the United States. And on the basis that the military response did not protect us from future terrorist attacks and was was making us less secure rather than more secure. And it just didn't have, we didn't get a lot of traction with that argument. Um, we barely believed it ourselves, I think. Uh, and, but so, but I think it's true. Nonetheless, like in I, retrospect, it's true, right? Also, but, uh, yeah. Also, one of your comments mentioned that mm -hmm. one of the, we didn't really mention that one of the goals of Hamas's offensive was taking hostages, both military and civilian to try to kind of exchange for Palestinian prisoners often who haven't had a trial by the way and maybe and yet yeah, that probably went into their calculation judging from previous incidents of when like uh, soldiers have been taken and exchanged for prisoners like I think Gilad Shalit was another was an example of this but in a way, that kind of proves that their calculation backfired on them because, because of the mass indiscriminate bombings the Israelis have done and some of the rhetoric from the leaders, which shows that they don't really give a damn about the hostages. You know, right. <laughs> and you know that, and you know, you've seen videos about people tearing down hostage, the posters of the hostages in like London or New York. You know, mm -hmm. that's happened in Israel as well by, by Netanyahu supporters because the supporters, the, the families of those hostages blame Netanyahu squarely for what happened and Netanyahu's cronies are now retaliating against them so right yeah. right and I think it's at the outset I said that the the U.S. left and the hard Israeli right seem to want the same thing, mm -hmm. um, which is for the U.S. to be uh, less entwined with Israel. And I, sometimes the, the liberal reformers on the left of the United States want the U.S. to stay uh, connected to Israel enough to be able to be truly constraining. Um, but there are those who would like to see, I think, just become a regional war and with the hopes of like uh the the, the defeat of the of u.s empire and and by the and of the development of a multipolar world and and um the defeat of israel and so on the the global south will have its day is the maybe the mentality of, of some on the on the left uh it's, by defeat by through the military defeat yeah what do you do you think that's do you think that's out there that idea uh, I'm, not, I'm not so much i don't think maybe a yeah, little, okay. i'm sure i'm sure there's a loud voice to say it but <laughs> right like i don't know maybe maybe jackson hinkle sort of believes that <laughs> now <laughs> <laughs> right 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 i think it's a it's a half believed fantasy i don't think people actually think it's possible but i think it's like uh you know that you got if we open up all these fronts you got russia you got mm. iran hezbollah uh, hamas maybe china will come in yeah. <laughs> how much can the u.s european empire take uh is maybe the fantasy uh. There, oh, you know? like they'll be stretched out in Ukraine, in Israel, and in Taiwan. Is that that's the logic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, even uh, Joe, but even Joe Biden's saying that we're we're the we're the most powerful country in the world. Of course, we can support two wars. You know, right. What about three? How about <laughs> that? <laughs> you know, um, yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's a. Uh, the real mess. I, and none of that would lead to anything good. No. You know, that's what I would say. Um, oh, listen, it's been an hour. Do you want to, could you come back for in 10 minutes or so for another hour? Would that, that'd be yeah. great. Sure. All right. And, and Ashley, I'll give you an opportunity to talk more. I'm sorry I dominated so much in the first half here. No, that's but, okay. Uh, As I said, like, uh, I'm tired of getting called a dumb bitch, so I'm just. <laughs> oh God! 
So, okay. All right. I'm going to end it here. Uh, thank you all for watching. Join us in the second hour. There's a link in the description. I'll put it in the comments. And we'll see you over on Patreon. In the case of nuclear 